And that is Zoom telling us. All that right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, before I get started sharing, um, I just want to uh, give like a trigger warning. Uh, my story does deal with uh, abuse and childhood trauma um, and addiction and self-harm. So um, I understand they're very sensitive topics and I think they're really important to talk about, but I also understand taking a break um, you know, taking a moment outside, doing whatever you need to do to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And um, also want to encourage if anyone has any thoughts throughout the presentation, if you want to just say it in the chat. Um, yeah, I want this to be as much of a discussion as possible. So um, just thank you all for taking the time to be here on your Monday evening. And um, I'm truly honored to be able to talk with you all and just to be here. Um, so I was born in Portland, Oregon, um, November 13, 1995. Um, when I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my parents, um, because I think that is a key, it's, it plays a lot of factors into my present life. So, um, my parents had met in Cairo, Egypt. Um, my dad was born in Egypt and he worked as a doctor and he was working at one of the large hospitals in Cairo. Um, and my mom was born in Portland, Oregon. And um, she had um, this calling in life to go overseas and to be a nurse and to um, be a missionary and just to be a bright light to um, other foreign countries that are struggling. So um, she decided Egypt was the place to go. Um, and I cannot imagine how she felt in her 20s only being in Portland, Oregon. But um, yeah, so she went to Cairo, Egypt, and they ended up working at the same hospital. So my dad and my mom eventually started talking and fell in love and got married. Um, and they had three children, including myself. So I am the youngest and I have two older brothers. Um, so both of my parents' dreams were to become doctor and nursing missionaries in countries that may not fully allow missionaries, um, but they were gonna be healthcare providers. So just shining a light. Um, and so there was a lot of testing that needed to be done um, to get certification so they could travel. And um, unfortunately, during those years, um, my dad was trying to pass a test. Um, so he was able to be a traveling doctor and he failed those tests and his mental health really, really declined at a fast rate. Um, so by the time I was born, my dad was really, um, struggling mentally and struggling with a lot of insecurities that he did not know how to process and deal with. Um, so when I was about two and a half, my whole family had lived in Egypt and um, I stayed there till I was about five and a half. Um, I don't have a lot of memory because I was really young, but um, what was happening when I was young um, and was living over there, my dad had grown increasingly paranoid about um, his marriage and eventually um, didn't know why my mom loved him and um, eventually started to think that she was trying to kill him. Um, so when I was 
two and a half to five and a half, my dad would leave to work and um, he'd make sure to lock up the apartment so that we weren't able to leave the house. Um, and then he would uh, basically use my two older brothers as bodyguards to watch over my mom um, and make sure she wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, and so even though I don't have memory of those times, I think it plays a, a huge importance on um, just my development growing up, um, being in an environment that is um, just unhealthy for, for everyone. Um, but uh, things had declined as we were in Egypt and, um, you know, my mom wasn't sure how she was gonna escape, basically how she was gonna get out. And um, miraculously over time, my dad had decided that we should go back to the States. Um, and to this day, my mom will say it's, it's a miracle that we made it back because of my dad's mental health and the state of his paranoia. Um, so I made it back to Oregon when I was about five and a half. And at that point in time, I was extremely culture shocked and um, confused, um, and I was extremely shy and, and just very, very self-conscious, um, so I grew really quiet, and, um, I basically just clung to my mom and stayed away from everybody else, um, so school was pretty rough, uh, I grew up in, um, the area close to Portland, but, um, I grew up around a lot of Caucasian kids. And so I was the only brown girl in my school. And that was really, really confusing for me um, because no one looked like me. And I didn't know why people wanted to play with my hair all the time. And, and um, I ended up getting bullied quite a bit. Um, and I just remember, from the time I was young all the way through high school, I just felt extremely out of place and like there was nowhere I really belonged. Um, I didn't have a friend group. Um, I just felt very alone and I felt like no one in the world was going to be able to understand me. I was the only one dealing with the problems that I had of not fitting in and um, yeah, it was a very isolating feeling. Um, and so when I was nine years old, my parents um, had legally separated and my dad's mental health continued to decline. And um, he is a paranoid schizophrenic, um, but he is un he hasn't been able to get treatment. So um, my childhood was very confusing. I remember just hearing dad can't be in the house right now. Um, he needs to get help to get better. Um, he needs some kind of medication. Um, and that was really hard to, um, comprehend as a kid. I just remember thinking like, what kind of medicine does he need to come home? And why does he need medication? That doesn't make sense. And why is it that every time we're in public, he makes these scenes and I don't understand why he's acting this way. Um, and so as my parents had separated, my dad moved out of the house, but continued to push boundaries and, um, eventually would use me as an excuse to come over to the house. And he would say like, I wanna spend time with you. Um, when in reality, he wanted to come to my house to creep on my mom um, and he didn't wanna spend time with me. And so I remember feeling this deep sense of rejection from him. Um, and I, I didn't feel good enough. I felt like there must be something wrong with me 
um, because my dad doesn't want to be around me. Um, so uh, at that point in school, I really pushed to have perfect grades. Um, I wanted to be the perfect kid. And I, I basically was seeking for approval. I was seeking approval from the teachers in my class. You know, I wanted to get the best grades to make them proud. I wanted to make my parents proud. So I put a lot of pressure on myself in school um, because I just wanted people to be proud of me and I wanted to get their approval and get a gold sticker. <laughs> um, and so even though my parents were separated, um, when you look at our family, we looked perfect on the outside. We looked very unified, very calm and collected. We would go to church every Sunday and Wednesday, put on that smile. How are you? Everything's fine. Um, and in all reality, I hated it um, because I would just come back home and into a broken family. And um, I remember just starting to begin to hate church because I had to go and I had to put on this front of everything's fine. We are a beautiful family um, and we love being here. We love being in our community when really we were isolated and all alone and extremely broken. Um, even when my brother had turned 12 and he started selling and using drugs, I remember he still had to come to church no matter how late we would be. So um, we had to make it to church every Sunday and Wednesday. Um, so growing up, I felt very lost and out of control. And um, I wanted desperately to be in control of something. And I wanted to find a way to calm the chaos that was going on around me. Um, I grew very overprotective over my mom. Um, I would see my dad pushing the boundaries and coming over and um, getting in fights with her. And so I would try and step in and try and kick my dad out as this little kid because I felt like if I don't do it, no one's gonna do it, so I have to. Um, and I think that was my way of trying to be in control of something because my whole life I, I just felt out of control. Um, so as I got older, I still struggled finding friend groups. I had one friend that has stuck with me through kindergarten and she remains my best friend to this day. Um, thankfully, she's extremely extroverted and basically said, you're going to be my best friend. So you're stuck with me um, and bless her because I would not be here if it weren't for her. Um, and so when I was 12, I went on a vacation um, back to Egypt, back to my home, and I felt so whole again, and I remember feeling so confused. I didn't know Arabic. I didn't know how to communicate. I was basically meeting my family for the first time, but there was something in my heart that just clicked, and it was like, this is, these are my people. This is where I, I belong, and um, it felt like the missing piece of my identity that I, I needed to experience. Um, and then I came back and everything was the same and I was still struggling um, in school and um, just at home. Home didn't feel like a safe place to me and that was really hard um, to grow up with. Uh, when I was 13, I felt like there must be something wrong with me because I, I've been rejected by my dad and because I don't have friends and I'm, I'm just 
feeling like I don't belong here. So there's something wrong with me. So um, eventually I started self-harming um, at around 13 years old. And that really was like my first drug. It was um, a way for me to punish myself when I felt like I, I did something wrong or felt like I'm, I'm this horrible person. Um, and it was also an outlet, you know, if something was going on in my family and I didn't feel I could control it, there was one thing I could do to control what was going on in my body. Um, eventually when I was around 14 years old or so, I started getting back into church and started finding faith in God. And I felt I felt something in me that was just on fire and I felt unstoppable. <laughs> and so um, I ended up going by myself to a mission trip to Mexico. And uh, that was a powerful trip for me um, because I, I witnessed a lot of miracles happening and it just, felt amazing to be in a completely different world and to experience um, just the beauty of humanity, even in a poor stricken area. Um, but unfortunately, when I came back, you know, you get back into your same old routine and eventually I just went back to um, hated going to church and um, just felt really resentful and angry. I felt very angry um, for everything that had happened. And uh, when I first got into high school, it was the first time boys started noticing me. And it kind of felt like I had lived in this protective bubble my whole life and then I entered high school and all of a sudden this bubble popped and I was in this whole different world um, that I didn't feel prepared for and I wasn't expecting. Um, so I started getting attention and I loved it. I love to feel this attention that I felt I had been missing from my dad and um, it was a great feeling to feel wanted. And, um, eventually that had led me to not getting into the best crowds when I was in high school. Um, before that though, I just want to say one quick thing that happened. It was really powerful. Um, I had a health class as a freshman and that was the first health class where I learned about depression. And I remember going down the checklist and I was like, I have every single one of these symptoms. And so I went home and I was like, mom, I, I think I have depression. And so that was my start of looking for therapy and um, trying to find the right antidepressant for me. So I started that journey when I was about 15. Um, and yeah, high school was brutal, was absolutely brutal. I slowly was feeling accepted by these boys. And so that meant I eventually started going to parties with older kids and um, started using drugs and drinking alcohol. Um, and it just felt like I was doing whatever the people around me were doing because I wanted to belong. I wanted to fit in so badly. And at the same time, I had so much pain in my heart from everything going on at home that I needed an escape. I needed to numb something to feel like I could survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I started getting into this really dangerous mindset of trying to numb the pain, using drugs and alcohol to numb the pain, getting in really bad situations because the people that had drugs and alcohol were dangerous and didn't want the best for me. 
Um, so it felt like it was a constant cycle. Um, and um, when I was still a freshman, I had met someone um, who became my boyfriend and it was my first long-term relationship. Um, and I was with this person for a year and a half and eventually had found out um, he had been lying about his age. And so um, instead of him being 17, almost 18, he was really 22 and 23. Um, and I, that was the first relationship I had where um, it felt like my innocence and purity was stolen from me. And um, it was the first relationship where I was manipulated and brainwashed to the point where um, I lied to the police because I didn't want him to get in trouble. Um, but eventually after a year and a half, um, there was a lot of abuse that had gone on. He, um, was the first person to sexually assault me. And, um, I think I just felt like a changed person after this predator had come into my life. Um, by the end of the relationship, he ended up getting four years in prison time for um, being with me and then with being uh, with three other people who actually had been my friends um, who were all 15 and 16. Um, so after this relationship, um, I, I felt forever changed. I felt um, broken and um, I just could not handle the pain that was inside of my heart and the trauma that I was living through. Um, and so again, the cycle of addiction continued even further because I was starting to experiment with more than just weed and alcohol and it was really anything I could get my hands on. Um, and during this whole time, I hadn't been doing school. Um, my life was revolving around this predator at the time. And um, so I wasn't really moving ahead in life. You know, I, I wasn't able to do anything um, for myself really. Um, and after that relationship, um, I started getting into worse crowds. I was um, hanging out with pimps primarily because I just needed a man to love me. And uh, eventually um, I was convinced that my worth is in money. I have a, I have a dollar sign. Um, and so that's how I went about my life on a day-to-day -day basis was I'm worth a certain price and the people around me need to pay a certain price to be with me. Um, and that was a way of trying to feel like I had power and trying to support my drug addictions and um, trying to distract my mind from the reality of everything I was living. Um, and eventually I had gotten in another relationship and, um, this person I was with for a longer time and, um, I felt very, very in love, um, and unfortunately it had turned pretty abusive. Uh, fairly quickly and um, I felt trapped and this was probably the the one person that I genuinely believed could kill me and um, 
So I, I stayed for as long as I could till eventually I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, and then I tried to leave and um, I had broken up with him via text. And unfortunately uh, he didn't like me trying to leave. So he had broken into my house that night um, while I was home and um, had to go through a process of getting a restraining order after that. And uh, that was very traumatic, again, to go through the court process of everything. And, um, and it was a new fear that had come up where I, I felt like I could be stalked or killed every day. Um, so it was a, a different kind of PTSD um, that had kind of activated OCD and hypervigilance. So I felt very alert all the time, very hyper aware and hypersensitive um, and had to do things repeatedly because I was so fearful of somehow being in danger again. Um, after all of that, I eventually was able to get connected with an alternative school, an alternative high school in Beaverton, and that was a place that had given me hope in education for the first time in a long time. Um, I had gotten my GED and started working jobs here and there, um, but I still was struggling to um, really face the traumatic events that had happened throughout my lifetime. I didn't know how to do that. Um, my way of surviving was to work these legal jobs, but then to make sure I had drugs and people around me, um, because I couldn't stand to be in my thoughts, um, alone by myself. Um, when I was around 20 years old or so, I had met a pimp that had connections to this one strip club. And um, he had told me I could start working there in two weeks. And I was thrilled. I was so excited to feel powerful and to um, get this income and feel like I'm using men instead of men using me. Um, and so right before I was about to start working at the strip club, um, mind you, I would have to be giving my money to this pimp. Um, my mom had told me that the church I grew up in was hiring and, uh, I was a little bit confused why she was telling me because I was far from church at that time and I wanted nothing to do with the place I grew up going to church at. Uh, but I decided to apply knowing that I wouldn't get the job. <laughs> and surprisingly, I got the job. <laughs> so um, that was a situation where looking back on it, I realized if I had not been pulled out of that environment and placed into a completely different environment, I never would have gone, gone out, right? I would have worked at the strip club and uh, started getting pimped out um, and probably dying a life like that, knowing where my head was at, knowing um, where my addiction was at at the time. Um, but thankfully, I started working at the church, and that was the first opportunity I had to be around good-hearted people um, and safe people, safe people that wanted to know my heart. They just wanted to get to know me. They didn't want anything from me. And um, I eventually started getting hope in people again. And I had joined a therapy group so, uh, specifically on sexual assault and it was only for sexual assault survivors and that was really where I could look at my life and put together all the puzzle pieces of why I did 
everything I was doing and put myself into these really dangerous situations just so I could feel love because I didn't feel it for my dad. Um, so over the last four or five years, I have been working um, on myself and healing and trying to learn who Katie is and um, embracing the pain as terrifying and as hard as that is. Um, so I've been continuing therapy. Uh, I think therapy is a beautiful thing. And um, I'm now working at a nonprofit mental health agency um, as a peer support specialist where I get to walk alongside other people um, struggling with their mental health and I get to share my stories and my personal experience and um, help them to not feel as alone as they are and to know that there is hope and um, healing's a lifelong journey. Um, and even though it's a lot of hard work, it is so beautiful and it's so worth it. Um, so despite all of the pain and all of the hard days and everything our country is facing, um, I just want to be here to remind you all to keep fighting the good fight and to keep loving and um, doing what you can to be providing a community for others, others like me that need it. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much for sharing or for listening to me share. I appreciate you all so much. I know I almost made it to an hour. So <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Wow, that was so powerful, Katie. And I just wanted to honor and acknowledge you um, for being so open with us and, and sharing your story. And through the hardships and injustices that you faced, you've also gained so much wisdom and insight and, and you put so much heart um, and care in telling your story. And I hope you also return that heart and care and taking care of yourself and also those that you support um, through the peer work that you do because only you can share the wisdom and insight that you've gained um, and do that justice with the way that you've done it with all of us here 